Amanda Staveley's left Newcastle United, and we're going to podcast today on if this means that PIF are about to invest big money in Newcastle United to transform the 24-25 season. I've got Matthew from 442, we've got Mick Martin and Stephen Ord to talk to you about what Newcastle United and Eddie Howe now need to do next season as surely the PIF investment rolls in. Ketch, I'll start with you, mate. Newcastle United, massive news this week. Amanda Staveley and Murdad Gadusi have left the club. I would suggest from what we've heard, what we've talked about, and also reading the statements that uh, this wasn't a voluntary departure from Amanda Staveley. What do you make of all? Very interesting. Uh, lots of layers to it, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, I think it was always the plan. I mean, it's pr- pretty obvious these these weren't football people. They, they were finance people who deserve a lot of credit for for making the takeover happen but ultimately were they ever going to stay long term I, I didn't see it I think it, from my point of view I think it maybe happened a little bit sooner than planned the plan was always for them to come in stabilize build an executive team they've done that um the language they used when they first came on the scene was sort of you know five eight years we want to be doing this and, that. and I, I thought they would stay the course for at least half of that maybe maybe longer so it's a little bit premature it's happened quite quickly quite suddenly and i think that that tells its own story what's mick i don't disagree with much of that i think the appointment of mitchell um last week was probably really uh, key to um everything happening so uh, we don't really know the story as to why ashcroft left um and uh you know what what happened what happened there maybe there was some kind of unhappiness at rules etc that's been agreed and and then days later mitchell comes in then he appoints bunce uh, another director and uh, amanda Stavely is is leaving so i don't think the two things are unconnected um there's a, a full executive team there of professionals and uh, i just didn't see when i reflect on it uh, as much that we you know, we thank Commander Stavely for a role in the history of the club, etc. I don't think there was a role any longer for her there. I think probably um, as her sh- shares or the amount of her shares that she held was being diluted, I think it was somewhere between 5 and half and 6% now when it started off at 10%. I think this was always a likely outcome because you can't continue to have someone on the board who keeps selling off an element of their share in the club. And the fact that I think the Rubens and Piff have allegedly both stepped in and bought the 5% each that they, that they owned um, just means that it's a more streamlined structure. I think it makes sense. Those are the guys who do have the financial backing to be able to take the club forward. And I think um, as much as, as Mick said, she'll have a place in the history of the club because she engineered this takeover, what was it, three years in the, what, two and a bit years in the making. Uh, so I think like there's a lot to be said for that. But I think the likely outcome is always going to be this and... It's maybe just been hurried along by the fact that we got so close to that PSR situation in uh, the 30th of June that they've decided now we need to step forward now and we need to like make a change because if you're not in a position to be able to invest further and kick this on. I think PIF sold themselves £31 million worth of shares a couple of weeks ago. Um, so they've had to make additional inward investment and that's probably been part of the reason why they've decided if you can't match that, then then we need to consider moving on. Yeah, the, the club statement was interesting. Uh, you know, it says, PIF and RB Sports and Media will increase their show, shareholdings in Newcastle United as part of the long-term plan to develop the club and make it a consistently credible competitor in domestic and European competitions. Which, are, you know, that's good. That's what we want. But also, that just, I just kind of find that, that interesting. That they're, they're, I think that's them saying this is a necessary step to to kick on to the next level and we've done podcasts recently talking about the lack of uh, next level investment from the outside looking in you know where's the new training ground we're, we're getting in for three years now of, of of the takeover and whilst i wouldn't expect them to have built a training ground necessarily you'd expect them to have uh, put some shovels in the ground perhaps or at least applied for planning permission somewhere maybe this departure will facilitate these kind of things because it, as you've all kind of touched that uh, Amanda Stavely and, and Murdoch Caduce potentially didn't have the funds to invest in uh, in these kind of projects or match the match the investment. Um, and of course, this stuff is all not involved in PSR calculations. PIF and the Ruben or Ruben Sports and Media can put as much money as they want into stadium developments and and the training ground. Mick, you touched on the the off the pitch appointments that we've seen, and I've just got a bit of a list for for listeners and viewers here of, of people who've hired uh, in, inside the last two years. And you've got Darren Eels, 
Peter Silverstone in 2022. You've got Jack Ross, uh, Simon Kappa, Dan Ginger, Jonathan Kane, Dr. Ian Mitchell, Brad Miller, and then in the last week, Paul Mitchell and James Bunch. It was pretty much just Lee Charney, pre, like pre, <laughs> pre takeover, yeah. doing all of those jobs. Maybe we didn't rate him as much as I <laughs> should have. Um, but that, 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 that is actually from the outside looking in a, a real kind of tight corporate structure. And if you think about the internal change in the club and, and how it operates day to day, that's got to be a huge change. I mean, the, the number of people for a start is massive. Not, not all of those people are at executive level but they're in kind of senior managerial positions who other people within the club will answer to and they'll all have to work together to kind of produce a, a, an off-the-pitch strategy and, and day-to-day running of the club that, that hopefully will, as the, the statement says, push us on to the next level to give us credibility domestically and from a European perspective. Do you guys think there's anything to that theory I've put to you about we might see the club after kind of 18 months of consolidation now since we qualified for the Champions League year, of consolidation do you think will now kick on i think people are looking for those big big picture infrastructure investments they're also looking for a massive transfer window ahead any thoughts guys i think probably in terms of the training ground and stuff the things have been on hold because you can't really just come straight in and click your fingers and they have to make i mean mick you've done a lot of stuff on this but this the sustainability of the ground and whether we move or not those that's a massive, massive investment. Like the training ground, I know we all want to see a brand new training ground, but it's not that big an investment probably for them as opposed to what they do with the stadium. And I think that's probably the biggest decision they've got to make. And that obviously has been at some point a study done, feasibility study that's gone to the club. And maybe that's the thing where people have gone, right, it's going to cost us this much to do and you're going to have to put in this much money. And then maybe people have gone, well, we can't do that. Right, okay, well then you need to step away because we need to kick on with some of these moves that we're going to make. And I think probably the the biggest investments that we're going to make are going to be in the ground, are going to be in the training area, wherever that might be. Are we going to build an Etihad style com- campus, excuse me, where we're going to have like a complex where all the teams are at. Um, and if we do that, again, that's another massive significant investment. It would seem to make sense that the people with the most money would put the most towards that and the people who don't have the money to be able to back it wouldn't be here anymore. The structure that we've got, I think it's the first time I can remember, Mick, you've been following Newcastle on the way, but it's the first time I can remember where we seem to have a professional every single level of the club. Um, n- no offence to Lee Charnley. Um, <laughs> but who seems to actually be in a position where they know what they're doing around their specific area of the club executive team. And I think that's a massive statement because we haven't had that like as long as I can remember. Um, so that's a that's a really positive step, and maybe that does mean that additional investment is on its way. Hundred percent right in in terms of the the structure. You know, they've got a chief operating officer, chief finance officer, <laughs> chief commercial officer, um, and goodness knows what else. Not to mention a sporting director and a performance director. So yes, it looks more substantial than it's ever looked in any point in my in my lifetime. Admittedly, that's a, a low bar when I think of the days of Lord Westwood. Uh, and make uh, and even more ridiculous under under Mike Ashley. The other thing is with those three big ticket investments that we're looking at, which is the training ground, the stadium, and more commercial income coming in. Is if that stuff's announced, that has an immediate impact on the share value. So the share value of of um, uh, that's re- that's remaining goes north, and there's only two of the three shareholder groups putting money in. That doesn't seem to me to be good business sense if you're uh, Piff or the Rubens and it's kind of like, well, how are pets tip up or tip or ship out? It's kind of kind of thing, you know. So I'd, uh, I'm hoping, I'm speculating, none of us know um, that that is the that's the reason and that's going to be the the next step. We're going to get into next season now. Uh, pre-season is underway at the club, so it's a good time to start considering it, talking about it, uh, catch. Off, straight off the bat, what, it, what does Eddie Howe and Newcastle United have to do next season? What's the bare minimum for you? Well, I just wrote actually in the 442 season preview, there's a little plug for mm-hmm. you, that uh, <laughs> Europe is a non-negotiable. I think he overachieved by getting us into the Champions League, then he's, he's underachieved last season. I think it's, ba- it's back to business now and Newcastle have to be regarded as a European club consistently, be that in the Europa League or the Champions League. And I think if they weren't to get a top six, I think that would be a major problem for him. So you're, you're excluding the conference here? It's I think that's that's cheating a bit, if you ask me. I think it needs to be that Europa Champions League conversation in top, top six. I'm going to go a bit further. 
and I'm going to say I think we need to be back in the Champions League. I think the amount of revenue that brings in and the status that it gives you as a club. I think Man United made three times or something what we made from the Champions League mm. this season in revenue. Like They finished bottom of the group as well, but because they've been so regular in European football, they get three times the money. I, I also think you can't have... £60 million footballers scoring 20 goals a season in the Premier League and then say to them, oh, but don't worry, if we're getting the Conference League next season or the Europa League next season, like that's that's progress. Like Isak and Bruno have brought in a project, fair enough, but I think they thought it was a Champions League project. And, you know, if you're going to go touting Anthony Gordon, allegedly, to Liverpool as a potential sale, like if he, if he doesn't go, you've got to offer him something that, they would offer him the following season. And if Liverpool are going to go, we don't know what Liverpool are going to do in Darny Slot, but if if they go back into the Champions League, then what's what's that message you send to your, one of your best players? Like, oh, thanks very much for your service. We think you're a Champions League player, but we can't offer you that now, but you've got to stay with us to kick on. I think Howe has to show that this Monday to Friday experience that we've had, <clears throat> that we've had, sorry, is... Is, is real, that he is the best coach on the training ground and that he can develop these players so that, I mean, probably the first five or six games are going to tell us what type of season we'll have. And unlike last season, we've actually got quite a good, in inverted commas, run. We've got any, a brilliant run. We've yeah. got a brilliant start. And that, I think that'll set the tone for the rest of the season. Um, and I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be top four or if we can sneak in in fifth, great. But I think it needs to be top four. I agree. I, I, my, my, my only proviso with all of that is is that the club has to back how, and I didn't think they really did last summer. Um, I thought the transfer business in the long term may prove to be good, but in the short term of preparing a team for the Champions League last season, I thought it was poor. Uh, and then they didn't do anything in January for well-known reasons. So they've got to, the whole club has got to get it right um, this summer, and they need minimum three best case scenario for players who can play in the first team come uh, come August. Uh, if they get those, and we all know kind of the positions that, are, that, 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 they're, that they're looking at, we hope. Um, if they do that, then I agree it's top four. Um, and anything beyond that, I think, how could be in trouble going into the new season. But you know what? I'm okay with that because that's pressure in the right way. Um, it's pressure to succeed. Um, and and Eddie Howe has got to prove that he can he can do it. He can, that that season before last wasn't a one off. Um, that he can get us into the top four. Uh, that and I think that's got to be the target. I agree. I think that there's there's a little bit of wishful thinking from some some parts of the fan base that everything is fine and everything's going to be okay. And last season was all right because you know injuries and. There was a lot of mitigation, but I agree with you, Ketch, that, that no European football last season for, for a club of Newcastle United, size, direction, ambition is a failure. I think Eddie Howe will feel that. I think it will hurt him over the summer. Um, but your point, Stephen, is, is the most important one for me. And I did a podcast this week on, on Patreon with Norman Riley, and he made a brilliant point because we were talking about um, this exact thing where you can't tell Alexander Rysak, hottest young property in Europe, to come and sign for you and say, we're going to do all these great things, but then we might have a couple of years where it doesn't go so well. And then we're relying on the other sides not moving so far away from us with that already massive financial advantage over us uh, in a PSR landscape that we're able to catch them and rein them in. And Bruno Gomares doesn't sit in his first press conferences and he cast out a player with the team, plays 19th in the Premier League and say the aim is to win the Champions League. That wasn't for 10 or 15 years time. And Norman made a great point to me. He said, but who was it who told them mm. <laughs> that mm. we're going to come here and win the Champions League? Because it probably wasn't the PIF. It was probably, looking at Amazon documentary, what we know, the outgoing mm. director and <laughs> shareholder. Yeah. So whether that, whether that initial enthusiasm for the success of the project in the immediate term is still there at the club in, term, you know, in terms of what we've all seen play out in, in a PSR uh, world, is, you know, we don't know. What we do know is, like Stephen said, it is going to be incredibly hard to keep these footballers without Champions League football. As Mick said, that's a good thing. You want to sign footballers who demand to play Champions League football. Makes your team much better. But what I think you're going to have to see from Newcastle United this season is a couple of things. You're going to have to see an absolutely rampant start. Actually, the last two seasons, we've started slowly under Hull. It wasn't just last season. Now, last season's paper fixtures were very hard. Everyone remembers the Sky Sports graphic. 
in terms of difficulty of start Newcastle miles at the bottom by themselves in 20th place with the hardest start because of the fixtures they ended up losing three of the first four and we were never in the top four last season at any point mm. um, the season before that I think we actually win only one of our first six now we lose only one of the first six as well but I think we'll go to Fulham away at the start of October after the international break in something like eighth place so it wasn't this kind of unbelievable start I think this time with the fixtures Newcastle have statistically on paper the easiest start of any fixture they have the the playoff promoted team at home in the first game as they did in 2022-23 under Nottingham Forest they need to win that they, need, they then need to go to Bournemouth and put um, right some of the wrongs that we've seen against Bournemouth over the last few games have actually been a really tricky side for Eddie Howe since he's been Newcastle manager and they need to kick on from there because as much as we're going to talk on this podcast and fans are going to talk amongst themselves about what Newcastle United are going to do, this is the Premier League and Spurs are going to think, right, we've got a season under Poster Coglu behind us, we're going to spend more money, we've got lots of PSR headroom, Arsenal are going to be stronger, Man City are going to be stronger, Liverpool are going to be desperate to not suffer the same fate as Arsenal as, and Manchester United did when they're kind of era-spanning managers left. So the Premier League, as it is every season, is going to be more competitive than ever. Newcastle and Eddie Howe have got to take advantage of that fixture list gift that they've got at the start of the season and get into that Manchester City home game on the 28th of September at 12.30 St James's Park. I'd say not just in the top four, but you know, possibly at the, at the right end of the Premier League in terms of where Man City and Arsenal want to be. Because if you look at the fixtures of all those other clubs, Newcastle actually don't play one of the top, top sides until quite late, until October nearly. So I think Eddie Howe and the team and the club have to gear themselves for a top four push. Like you said, Stephen, it could be fifth. That's the beauty of the Premier League. If there is that kind of coefficient boost next season from a strong performance from English teams, fifth might be good enough. But, you know, I haven't mentioned Aston Villa. I haven't mentioned Chelsea, Chelsea you know, new manager, all yeah. these things. It's, it's such a competitive league. Howe has had, this will be his third full season as manager and he got a good chunk of the previous season. Is going to be on six six transfer windows, albeit like Mick said, the last two haven't been great. And that's what the club need this this summer. We need a transfer window now. They've got the corporate structure in place. They're free of their PSR woes. They need to produce for how in the transfer window and spend. You know, they, they can't outspend a lot of the clubs we've spent, and we haven't outspent them a lot of the time. So they have to spend smart. They have to make good decisions in the transfer market, and they have to have thinking that's a little more a bit more joined up, joined up than putting £38 million on a lad in Harvey Barnes, who I like a lot, but I think we all probably agree if Anthony Gordon's in Newcastle player and August the 16th or whatever, then Harvey Barnes is on the bench. Just to finish this section, lads, I suppose a little bit a little bit from any of you on the transfer window, what do you, what do you really want to see to, to, to allow how to kick on to these kind of things we're talking about? I think, um, I think it's fairly obvious, isn't it? Um, right-sided centre-half, right-winger, centre-forward. Does anyone disagree? No. No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm in agreement. Although potentially a left back because we've spent twenty eight million pounds on someone who Eddie Howe doesn't really seem to think is the long term left back for Newcastle United. So uh, that would be the only other position that you'd have to con- have to potentially consider. You got Matt Target, <laughs> yeah. you got Lewis Hall, Dan Burton, Lloyd Kelly, Jamal Lewis, Lewis. <laughs> Jamal Lewis, five <laughs> left backs. I'd love to see an out of the box right side centre half near Botman's level can come and oh, yeah. come and start straight away and that's where I would probably put most of the budget I think the striker could be a younger striker and an understudy but someone who's there and available at any time and then the right wing I'd like to see have Premier League experience someone like Harvey Barnes's level so I would focus on the centre half personally and uh, then maybe the right side of midfielder then uh, a younger striker who can who can mould into a Premier League player Does it also depend on though who we move on because Guardiola is very keen that his squad size is 24, 25. You've only got two people competing for every single position. I know we joked about having six left backs or whatever, but we've got five goalkeepers because Dubravka's still on the books. Mm-hmm. We've got yeah. however many people who can play in centre midfield, etc. And I think that's we've got two first choice left sided midfield players. Realistically, we've got Jacob Murphy and Miggy Almiron, who, no offence to them, neither of them I think would get in any other team in the top eight. Yeah. So we need to strengthen on the right hand side of midfield. I completely agree, but we also need to move one of them on because otherwise we're going to end up in the same position as we did last this year, last, next year, trying to ship someone out at the last minute for however much money and that we can't constantly find clubs who are willing to pay 30, 35 million pound for um, a player who hasn't even played in the Premier League. It just, it just won't happen. 
We should talk about Eddie Howe a little bit more in the context of, of the season ahead. Uh, we've already touched a little bit on on potential pressure that he might be under. Ketch has talked about his, his key ally, the person that hired him within the club, having departed and how that might impact on him. Hugely popular with the fan base, despite the seventh place finish last season. I think everyone is really excited to see what he can do, particularly if he's backed appropriately in the transfer window. One of the things that I'm keen to kind of see how operating is and this is a, a little bit like the Euros with Gareth Southgate so I'm not a Gareth Southgate fan despite he's you know objectively done a, a good job in terms of his objectives of advancing England through tournaments is every game you've seen England play this tournament and most games they've played in every single tournament at Southgate I've looked at the other side and thought there's not many of their lads would would get a game for us and the difference is with how is actually when you look at 11s and even this this is at Newcastle with a lot of players fit, not the kind of ragtag teams of last season, even even going into this season, when Newcastle face up against a Chelsea or a Liverpool, you know, th- there's still probably a, not a lot of Newcastle's first team that Spurs and Liverpool fans are thinking we'd have him over maybe three players. I think that's fair to say. So how is still, he's, he's performing with a smaller wage budget than all of these clubs were saying he needs to try and finish above, or not all of them, but most of them. Uh, the team costs less, currently anyway, than, than these hugely expensively assembled sides. And, you know, there, there's less internationals in there. If you look at the Euros for Newcastle, there's hardly any Newcastle players playing. There's not that many players in the Cup of America playing. So, it, it, uh, open question to, to any of you, actually, before we talk about England a little bit more with Stephen. Um, are these unrealistic expectations? When, when you look at the maths in front of you, we're all saying what the PIF want are we expecting Eddie Howe to produce another, another miracle next season to achieve the club's objectives? Rafa Benitez with a massive budget. Um, I, I can't... I, I, I feel like there is the element that we've got some players who now, regardless of what we paid for them then, if you look at Isak now, I think we paid £60 million. I think you'd probably be looking north of £120 million yeah, yeah. Pounds to sign him. So paper value for like the squad that he's got the squad's gone up massively. Now, a lot of that's down to his work and his coaching and his tactical setup of the side, absolutely. Um, you're right. There probably wouldn't be many top eight sides clamouring for Sean Longstaff to come in and fill a hole in their midfield. Uh, I think we are asking him to do something which is unusual, but as Mick said, if he's backed this summer with three or four signings, then no, probably not. We're not asking him to pull off miracles. I think if we end up in a position midway through the season where Dan Burns back playing left back. Well, then, yeah, yeah, we are. Because we know what happens. Like, fast, speedy right wingers just go by him. Um, and that's no offence to him. It's just he, he, he can't keep up with them. Um, I suppose it also depends on the situation with this kind of leadership group and in inverted commas that he's got. And it's like, at some point, some of them are going to have to move on. I think four of our back five are out of contract next summer. Like, when do we start looking at what's happened with those? Do they all get, like, one-year rolling extensions or do some of them get moved on? And obviously there's a England right-back or left wing-back um, <laughs> that, like, there's got to be that conversation about because the rumours are, or there's lots of rumours around about whether he'll be here next season, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it, it's asking a lot for him to say, go and challenge Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool maybe, like, for the top three, right, and go and push for the title. Um, because Jurgen Klopp couldn't even keep Liverpool in the title race uh, at the end of last season. I, I don't think asking him to challenge Villa or Spurs or Chelsea, who finished above us despite being an absolute mess for most of the season, I don't think that's asking a lot of him because I think he's got the players there and the talent already there to do that. He's got, he's got to be backed and he's got to be backed with the right players. So if they piss, piss about like they did... 12 months ago and signed two fullbacks, two young fullbacks who were very promising, etc. And we all liked them, um, but they weren't ready to come in. If they were to bring in Barnes, who you think, when well, he plays the same position as Gordon, you know, what, what's going on there? Um, and then Tenali with all the, you know, sheer bad luck, or whichever way you prefer to look at it. Um, and really, you're starting with the side that finished the previous season, and then you get to January and you don't do anything, then how can say, fuck are you? expect me to do so this summer it's absolutely pivotal for the club to prove itself to how and prove itself to the support as as well as all the other way other combinations of that so as mick says it, it is time for the club and we've kind of touched on the show with the structure that they now have in place they've got a new adidas bumper massive 
deal. They've hopefully got more commercial deals incoming. They've started to develop around St. James's Park. There's all sorts going on. And it feels like the club has massively caught up off the pitch in terms of those things. But on the pitch, we've gone backwards. And that's, that, that, that's wrong. That's the wrong way around. We need to get back to where we were on the pitch. And we need a really good transfer window. That point about January is a good one, Mick, because as much as you know, we can look at how and think, oh, well, we got knocked out of Europe and then everything was supposed to be kind of better from that point on, how would say, well, you know, I was having to play children in midfield, essentially. Yeah. You know, kids in midfield, uh, Bruno Gmarsh couldn't put a tackle in for yeah. six months. How am I supposed to manage in the most competitive league in the world under, under these restrictions when you can't go out and get me a loan, a loan centre midfielder and, to help and, me carry the, the team? And, let, and let's be honest about that. You know, they, they weren't that far away from Villa in, yeah. at fourth. So had they gone out in January and signed two players, for example, for argument's sake, and then really kicked up, kicked on in the and, it, and they did finish the season re- reasonably strongly, but then again they didn't beat Brighton, they didn't beat Man United when they sh- when they should have, and those little kind of results killed us at, at the end. We weren't that far away from Villa, uh, and a, a couple of players in January might have just done it. The, it might have. We'll never know. It's you know an untest an untested plan B, which are infallible, aren't they? But you know, let's let's be honest. Two players in January. How many points were we behind Villa? Was it six? Eight, or, I think. Six, eight points. Brill, we'll leave it there. Thanks, thanks to you three for that. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks to everybody for listening and watching. We'll be back with another free podcast this time next week. We're going to speak to a series of ex- experts on Saudi Arabia and the PIF and what it means for Newcastle United moving forward. Looking forward to that one. Speak to you all then. Bye bye. <laughs>